Good evening. Welcome to Street Talk. My name is Dominic Cotton. Unfortunately, Father Russ uh, can't be in here with us today. Um, he's uh, having to deal with uh, some, some staffing issues and some other people. Uh, we want to say our prayers out uh, for, for, for Bobby over in the staff, um, that he hopefully gets better um, as he's in the hospital right at the moment. Um, this evening, uh, I have a great guest. Uh, one, of, one of our favorites that we've been working with for, uh, I guess it's coming up on like two and a half years or so, mm -hmm. uh, who's been on, on appropriations and, uh, and uh, has been on our issues as, as, as far as brain injury uh, that we've gone up with. The one that always, always makes me say that I look good whenever I'm nervous is uh, as I'll help. But you there. do. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Gail Laviel, who's our, our repeat guest here, and we always love to have because um, you have such diverse views on so many different things, and I know that you're involved uh, with uh, multiple levels throughout the legislature, and um, we so appreciate you here. I love being here, Dominic. It's a, we always have such a good chat, and we cover a lot of points. And you're such a wonderful advocate in the legislature. Yeah, we <laughs> <laughs> we have our fun up there. You know, um, I mean, last last time around, I mean, I will I will mention this. Um, a Department of Social Services came up, and they they wanted to uh, um, kind of uh, privatize. Uh, their the, their social work function for, for the brain injury population and, and we opposed it um, obviously um, and I, I like to say that you know you, you, you think that people are are their their party but I think it's it's there's a lot of nuance that goes on within there because as much as people here oh Republicans like to privatize everything in the public sector it's different than that you, you take a look at the situation and you say, what's right for the constituents or the people that are being served within this? And uh, for what we were asking and for what they wanted to do, this wasn't a right set of circumstances. That's exactly right. So once again, <laughs> all, my, all my friends on the Republican side of it actually voted it down and we, we had a large uh, uh, portion of, uh, of the Democrats um, come up and, and vote down with it. and. I think this was something new for Department of Social Services because they're they're used to getting their way or nobody really questioning them. They were a little surprised. Yeah, I think that I think they they were. Aware. But you know, Dominic, this is why I, I really feel strongly that whenever you have an issue, whenever you have a problem to solve or a bill to look at and vote on, you have to look at that particular bill that particular issue, read the language, look at all the specifics, and make up your mind based on what is in front of you, rather than having a doctrinaire view on everything. Which is, is the point, is, is taking yeah. the time to read it. And I, and I know I, that, that's for me what uh, I usually do, is I, I, if, if, if it's something that I'm really working hard on, I really take it apart and mm -hmm. analyze it and try to look at the situation and uh, I might be a little different than most people. I try to look at it from all sides of the argument, including where the administration's going with it and, and understanding what they're trying to accomplish within it. And I, and I do know what part of Department of Social Services is trying to accomplish. I know Commissioner Brenby came in there years ago, and it, it was to modernize it. And uh, modernizing is, is, is a very painful process. Uh, yes. <laughs> so I'm sure we could say with, with, with many, uh, many different agency, modernization is, is it's, and it's difficult because people are accustomed to things, but you can't just look at it from the top down and say, we're going to do this. And that's the way that I always feel that they, that they walk in there is they're walking top down and they're saying, we have this great plan, and, and, and here, this is going to make everything better instead of taking a look at it from the bottom up and how can we work to come up with a solution together. And um, I know it's more difficult to do that um, as in within any organization. I think it's difficult to do that. But I think at the end of the day, you get a, a better product. Well, you do, and if you don't do it, then you, you have to do just as much work or more, usually more, cleaning it up. Yes. <laughs> um, the case in point with that that's going on right now that probably everyone 
to the last person in Connecticut is aware of is the DMV. <laughs> yes, yes. And um, that is, if just for background, um, the, uh, several years ago, the DMV signed a contract for $25 million to do an upgrade of its computer systems. Mm -hmm. And so they completed phase one a while back, and then they rolled out phase two last August. And um, when they had to actually shut down the entire DMV for customers. For a week. For a week yeah. last August. And then when they reopened, uh, wait times for customers tripled. And there are some other problems as well um, linked to, that it's really a two-pronged thing. Um, the new legislation that allows people who are undocumented to get drive-only licenses. Mm -hmm. And um, they had postulated, they had estimated a demand of about 18,000 applications last year. They got 52,000. Wow. And so those two things combined, all happening at the same time, the system upgrade <clears throat> and this overwhelming demand meant that whatever you were trying to do with the DMV just you know, sorry, it's going to take forever, and then people are getting stopped because their car isn't registered anymore because there's oh, an insurance If you insurance change, change your insurance, they, right. they, 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 uh, they, they let people know back and forth, and uh, you got fined for it. And might Absolutely. Not know about the fine. So, I mean, it, it just couldn't be more wrong on the consumer end. Now, interestingly, our, our, um, our House Minority Leader, Themis Claritas, whom you know, mm -hmm. um, several months ago when all of this was first happening said we must have hearings on this next session and and we will and she's been very steadfast in you know making sure that happens but we all know that hearings are a good way to let the public know exactly what's mm -hmm. going on but in terms of you know fixing it um, how much will it cost all those things um, we we need to have all of those answers in order to make sure the DMV fixes it. So I went to see the DMV commissioner this week. Andres, I know. And yes, <laughs> he was he was lovely. He was very cordial, yeah. and he had all these senior staff there. And so I got to ask a lot of questions. That's how I know what the demand was, mm -hmm. um, and and what they were doing to serve that. Um, and then also, here's what here's what jumped out at me. And perhaps this is typical, but it doesn't solve the problem. Um, the upgrades to the system do indeed allow the system to operate more efficiently. Mm -hmm. It, you know, in terms of cataloging information and cross-checking and all that sort of thing. Um, and also, uh, it will eventually allow people to do a lot more things more easily online so they don't have to wait. But what it didn't, I don't seem to discern that what it had as a goal was time saving for people. Except for, you know, if they go online for certain things, not all of which are available now. So the, the, the initial goals, the primary goals, and the expectations that people have of this thing are at cross purposes. Um, when they finally get the system itself back to somewhere it ought to be, it's not clear to me that delays will be any better than they were before they upgraded the system. They might even be a little bit worse. I don't know. But certainly I don't have a definite answer that they'll be better, right? I always laugh because, you know, I, I, I always feel like people always think, okay, progress. This is going to make everything better. And, and I know, and, and Bridgeport Hospital is probably not going to like me on this <laughs> one, um, but they implemented a, a, a new system. It's called EPIC. I call it EPIC Fail. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody who's, who's dealing with it hates it. They developed it in-house. Now, I mean, I have a lot of experience with this because uh, one of the residential treatment centers I worked with back in um, the early 2000s, um, we had our own behavioral um, health system. We used to record uh, all behaviors on everybody. It was, you know, it was, it was very data-driven uh, for things. But again, it was nuanced. 
unless you knew how to utilize the system, yeah, you could, you know, be completely confused by some of the information that you got. So you have to have people that understand what you want to accomplish with the system. Well, and you have it. to have people that are, are, are able to kind of break it down. Like I could have one person have the worst day on the face of the earth and have 5,000 behaviors. Mm -hmm. And you look at them over like a month long period and it says, wow, this guy's like increased all his behaviors and have nothing on another day. Unless you knew to like go back and look at it and say, okay, let me take a look at this day by day mm -hmm. and see if there's like, you know, information error for somebody not putting the information in correctly or other things along those lines. You could just look at the outcome and you say, wow, you know, this person's getting a lot worse. Yeah, you know? I mean, the outcome is really, really important. And one of the things that um, I, I hope and I believe the DMV is going to do um, is to outsource, and this is a case where privatization is, if you want to call it that, is very appropriate. Um, we already have AAA doing um, license renewals. Mm -hmm. I had mine done there, you know, my real ID. Um, it took less than 30 minutes, and other people have had the same experience. Um, AAA, as an example of a place to do this, um, is interested in the possibility of doing more. Fits and in with their mission. <laughs> exactly. And, and the DMV is not hostile to this. So that's good. That's a good thing. And I want to see that move along. And I also, um, there are some, I think, uh, solutions to, on a, from a cost perspective. This has mm -hmm. nothing to do with whether you like drive-only licenses or not. Um, from a cost perspective, there are, you know, because the demand's so high, they've got to have provisional people in there dealing with it and all that. There's a way to manage that, too, from a cost perspective, and I've got some ideas about that that I'm going to talk about during the session. Um, and uh, so there are, there are, some, there are, are definitely some things to do here, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the, to the hearings that, that Themis is, is trying to get set up. But, um, you know, I, I think that... Uh, uh, this has to be done fast. The public has a lot of expectations and every single person's affected by it. It is, it is across the state. Now talking about, I know I had uh, one, one, one of my friends went down to, uh, to, to Norwalk to uh, talk about uh, uh, DDS. Mm -hmm. um, and here's, here's another, uh, I guess, complicated situation that everybody looks at from the outside and says, well, we spend like a billion dollars mm -hmm. on this population. Why can't we have everybody served? And how, how, how is it possible that we spend so much on uh, the regional centers, which, which her son is, is, a, is a part of? Um, and then she looks at it, and she's been fighting with DDS for... <laughs> decades yeah. <laughs> and, and and she's she's, she's very good at it I, I, mm -hmm. I pointed her in the a little bit better in the direction of some things that she wanted to find out and um, when it comes to the budget they'll give you the overall numbers but to get like the 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 the, the dig down sort of information within there very difficult yes. very difficult the the bus way Connecticut fast track um, the DOT doesn't seem to be able to give us a figure on what they're taking in in terms of fare revenue and what their operational costs are. The DMV doesn't seem to be able to say, okay, well, we've rolled out phase one and two of this $25 million program. Here's exactly what we've spent. It's, it seems to be very tough. This shouldn't be. Well, there you, are balance sheets. We should are, know. You and I, uh, uh, I mean, I've obviously I've been a been in business and I've, I've run large organizations, mm -hmm. you've run too. large organizations, you, you know, you live and die on your financial oh information in order to be able to make decisions or yeah. in order to be able to, to, to understand it. And sometimes even your financial people, again, might not understand the nuances that you as a manager can, can be able to get within that. But you have to be able to know this information. How, and I can look at certain things from the outside and, um, you know, say, Southbury Training School and the regional centers, they run a ton of overtime. 
you know, and, and her, her solution that she came back with was, well, how come they can't hire some part-time people? And I'm sure that's probably got more to do with the well, contracts. I, I, went to a, I went to a meeting recently in the regional center in Norwalk, where I, I know a lot of the people who have mm -hmm. a member of their family there. It's very valuable to them. And, you know, I, the, the, gosh, if anybody should be served, it's these families. Yeah. They have a very hard life and uh, a lot of obligations. And I said, and the director was sitting there of the regional center, and, as we, and who's a wonderful woman, and as we, as we talked about it, the problem is, you know, they have, their, they have um, empty beds at these places mm -hmm. because they can't hire enough people to serve capacity. And the reason they can't hire, one of the reasons they can't hire enough people is that they have such a high level of fringe benefits that they pay the people they already have. It's so expensive for them to hire one person because of the contractual obligations that they literally can't staff up to their normal projected level. Mm -hmm. And if you look at an organization like STAR, which is a community nonprofit and doesn't have those contractual obligations, they of course are, are you know, underfunded by the state, but they can at least hire the people they need. Well, I think I think this. I, I know this was 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 one of the big things that came out. Uh, I know from the special session, uh, I actually met with with with, uh, with Len Fasano. I went to his one of his constituent meetings uh, uh, right after they were done um, negotiating to that point, um, and really. It's it's some of the long term fixes that you're looking at this. Yes. Within and and one of the major ones were labor agreements. Well, that is that, that is really that the is, crux that of is, the whole that matter. That is the, the whole matter. And and I think of back to Department of Social Services and they were talking about you know what they what they were wanting to do with pri privatizing, and they threw out a number that kind of like a little bit shocked me. Uh, somebody asked them how much it costs to have a social worker. Mm -hmm. I think they threw out a number of like $138,000. So I know social workers. Yes, you do. <laughs> and, and I know actually on, on the list, because you can actually look up and mm -hmm. it will tell you what everybody's salary is throughout the state. Um, and I know like what they earn. I mean, it's, you know, somewhere in the range of probably about $85,000. You throw your social security in there and you're probably somewhere around, you know, a hundred, uh, close to a hundred. So you got thirty-eight thousand dollars in other benefits. Yeah, it's you know again. It, if I, it it makes me very angry to hear people say, "You're beating up on state employees." Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. First off, if something doesn't change with the, and I'm ta I'm not talking salary. I'm talking fringe benefits. Mm -hmm. If something doesn't change, the state employees are not going to get the benefits they have been promised when they retire. They're just not. And so part of it is actually looking out for them. But the other thing is, if you look, for example, at teachers, teachers pay, they're not state employees. No. Teachers pay 6% of their salary into their retirement fund, into their mm -hmm. retirement, as a retirement contribution. State employees pay 2%. Why should teachers be having to pay more? Shouldn't state employees and teachers at least pay the same? This is not, you know, killing them or taking their jobs away or beating up on them. This is logic. Well, is, is it teachers also that they, they don't pay into the Social Security system? Because oh, that's, they, a, that's they, a whole they, different... They pay into their own retirement. That is, that is, a, um, that, that is an unfortunate provision that um, Connecticut somehow elected to put into effect back in the 70s or something, 70s or 80s. And now if you're a second career teacher, like you've worked in business for 20 mm -hmm. years and you've paid into Social Security, you start as a teacher in Connecticut, you have to give up your Social Security that you paid for. That's crazy. That's insane. And I, I would, we really need to do away with that somehow. But uh, that's not a Connecticut legislative decision. It's it's just awful, and that's a that's a whole wow. other ball yeah. of wax. But it's still, <laughs> I mean, this is the state retirement plan. This is not Social Security we're talking about. No, 
No, no. And um, uh, so. But that is, I mean, I, I think the, the, the issue real, really, and, and when everybody's looking at dollars and cents, it is. It's long-term stuff. Yes, it is. It's long-term debt. And, and, and but I, I'll give you another example, though, and a, a little background. In the Appropriations Committee, we do see and vote on every mm -hmm. negotiated contract, contract. Yep. for state employees. Now, the legislature then has the right in both chambers to vote up or down on those contracts. But if they don't do it within 30 days, they automatically go into effect. Now, back in 2011, when the governor opened the, uh, I know you know, this too well, actually. When the, when the governor went over those contracts in 2011, we, my caucus, proposed that we vote, and the majority party said, "No, we will not vote on the contract. Sorry," because they didn't want to be on record as voting for them, but they mm -hmm. wanted to let them go ahead and go into effect. So. We're now starting the ball game over again because between last year and this year, all of those contracts, there's I think 12 of them, I may be slightly mistaken, but it's mm -hmm. around 11 or 12 of them, are coming up for review, at least on wages and some other provisions, although not the, long, not the retirement benefits. Right. One of them came up already last year, and we had it in appropriations. State, state police. police, state yep. troopers. Um, I'll give you an example of what was in that contract. We had four hours of questions we asked. Um, state troopers receive a stipend for protective shoes. Great, they should. Mm -hmm. They also receive, and I think this is a good thing too, if they work with a dog, they receive a stipend to take the dog home at night and feed the dog and care for the dog. That's good too. They should mm -hmm. get those stipends. I agree with that. But here's what else happens. Those stipends go into calculating their final pay for retirement purposes. Yeah. So it inflates their salary. Yeah, there, there, uh, there's, and I know people who work in corrections and also have friends in state police. I hope I still have friends in state police after this. But um, one of the major issues that I have is how people can inflate their final numbers right. on going into their last three years based on the amount That's of correct. overtime that, that they are. And a lot of these people, and take it for granted, I, I understand completely, they're in very hazardous jobs, uh, they put 20 years in, in, in hazardous conditions, they can retire. Right. And, at, and they can inflate their numbers for retirement, and then once they're out of that career, the majority of them don't just like you know. No, they go to another. They don't job. go off into the sunset. No. Mm -mm. They 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 go off and they they either start another career or you they 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 might be an investigator mm -hmm. or, or other things along those lines. Right. So, and this and this is as you said, this is not about you know not acknowledging their hazardous duty. No. Yes, they should. Their wages are higher because of it, and they get to retire earlier because of it. But don't inflate those wages with overtime right. at the end of the trail. And at the end of the day, because those numbers are inflated, you can't hire on That's right. more state police to be able to cover. So That's it's right. almost like you're, you're, you're walking into a, 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 a vicious cycle, or, or, or they can go on and, and you know, do work like in, in the state. I think they're limited to like some 15 or 18 dollars Yeah, that's the double dipping thing. Yeah. But they, they can, there are other things. There are other, there are, there are plenty other fine. things And that's fine. That's their do. business. Yeah. If they want to go work in the private sector, more power to them. I think it's great. They're probably very experienced and, and good employees, but, you know. But I think it should be, I think it should be based on your base pay, not your base pay plus everything well, else one, that gets crazily that is added one of in. The, that's one of the many things we have to fix, and for two reasons. You know, we, one is the long-term unfunded pension right. obligations yes. of this state are only funded at 42%. The, the other 58% we don't have the money to pay for over the long term. The second, pro and that is affecting our bond ratings. The second problem is, you know, we have the, they, they say they fixed the deficit in December. Yeah, I guess I'm well, we have a, the fix we, there. <laughs> we, have a, we have a current deficit now in this fiscal year, which ends next July 1st. We then have a projected uh, deficit of uh, more than almost $4 billion for the following two years, the following budget cycle. 
And what they did to fix the current deficit, you know, fixed it for now. We're still in this fiscal year. We're going to go back into deficit because there were no long-term fixes. Mm -hmm. They were all designed just to fill up the hole that had been created this year. And we said, and I think they knew, that budget was bad and untenable last May. Mm -hmm. But they went forward with it anyway. And this is just... This is just hoodwinking people in Connecticut. It's hoodwinking taxpayers. It's ridiculous. They're paying more and services are getting worse. Well, that's that, that would be my point that uh, I know uh, as part, of, in that part and parcel in that special session, there was $35 million in savings that they were supposed to come up with out of uh, Medicaid. <laughs> and, and so, uh, again, this, this is one of those situations where you, where you sit there and you ask yourself, okay, where are you going to pull $35 million from? I know where they pulled it from, and I'll tell you. <laughs> I know part of where they pulled it from. Part, part of it was actually in my program, and the way they backfilled it was they, they told us that they can't add on new people who are in the community who are waiting for services, which is the ones that we really fought yep. for out of the whole ABI waiver one and two, uh, until somebody comes off the ABI waiver one program. Well. They're two different things. They're two separate, like, different accounts. But here's what the legislature does to get money, Dominic. Marvelous. Just marvelous. You'll remember that during the special session, we all stood there and discussed the transportation lockbox. Yep. Okay? Keeping money in the special transportation fund to spend on rebuilding our, special, mm -hmm. our transportation infrastructure, which is crumbling. Right? and running our trains and stuff like that. Well, as we were discussing this lockbox, keeping all those funds in there and being spent on what they're supposed to be spent on, they raided the special transportation fund for exactly your number, $35 million. Yeah. So that's one place where they got it. So out of one side, it's like, we got to spend this money on transportation. And then the other one is, let's spend the transportation money. Well, it's because pe people feel, look, I feel comfortable, and I, I, I live in Milford, so I'm in between two huge projects that I think are well over like $2 billion, New Haven and, and, and the Stratford Bridge. And they were bridges, you know, and, and certainly through New Haven, that benefits us all. It's the gateway to New England, literally through there, mm -hmm. going up 91 and, and Absolutely. out to the different areas. Um, so undeniably, I have no problem with money that's spent on transportation, but that's what people want to know, is they want to know, if I'm paying this amount in gas tax, if I'm paying this and this, exactly, is it going to go to what's really being done? Now, like I said, I'm, I'm fortunate. I look around at the projects that are going on. Some of them are very, very innovative. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, I'm, like I said, I'm happy that they're, they're, they're finally like widening through all of like New Haven, like, you know, the... The, the miles before and the miles after, because you can actually, when it's done, hopefully in another year or so, it, you can actually make it through there. Yeah. Um, and I look at Bridgeport. Bridgeport's uh, replacing uh, bridges on uh, Route 8. They're, they're, they're doing a new system where they're mm -hmm. actually building the bridges. You, you can watch them. They're off to the side, and they're, they're doing them, and then they're going to, like, crane lift and put these into place. These are great innovations. You know, these are, oh, these sure. are, these are smart investments, Mawak down by you, the, yep. the, the Route 7 interchange, you know, blow, blowing through the, the rock over there so that they can make that lane so when people come on, uh, and uh, God forbid, I, I know the Yankee Doodle Bridge is coming up to its time, and that's going to be like another mm -hmm. uh, cost. And, and I think people, you know, we learn by accidents. So I think of back in the 80s when the Mayanus River Bridge mm -hmm. Uh, imploded, <laughs> yeah, and 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 sometimes it, it, it takes to that moment before people realize it. I'm glad that there's an initiative to go want to do some of this infrastructure. I know the large difficulty Connecticut has is that all these bridges and highways were built at the same time in the '50s, and so instead of taking in all that toll money and and <clears throat> and putting some aside to say, okay. These are going to be long-term obligations that we're going to have to pay for at a later point in time. You know, like you said, mm -hmm. the money's been erased. That's right. 
year after year. And this isn't this isn't short term. No, it's it's happened it's, it's, it's happened long-term. over decades. And um, you know, the current effort I, I have been a very strong proponent. I've introduced lots of bills to create a lockbox. Um, I when we stood up to discuss this at the special session, um, I was among those who felt that the way that the language was construed in, in that bill mm-hmm. wasn't very good. I voted for it anyway because I have been so vocal on the subject, and I, I can't vote against a lockbox. But I'm, I'm happy that we have another crack at it because it did go down. It didn't pass, but we have another crack this session at creating, um, it, you know, a lockbox is a metaphorical term, but yeah. setting this up to where you really would have to uh, go to enormous lanes to divert transportation money to another purpose. And the way you do that, and I, I am introducing a bill to make a stronger lockbox in the constitutional amendment proposal, which is to specify the transportation, the, the, the revenue streams that must go into the fund, like rail fares, bus fares, gas tax, um, anything that might be, I, I'm hoping we won't have tolls, but if we do, they have to go in there. Um, you know, all of those revenue streams must go in and then enumerating the purposes that they must be used for. So for example, you could not take money out of this fund and spend it on the vehicle fleet for DDS or DCF or DSS, right? That I, I think that's like the fine print. <laughs> it's not the fine print because they will use any no, excuse I mean, to take that. that's the fine print of like what actually happens. A exactly, lot of they like take I it out. They out. just use it for anything. Or what they'll do is you you raise the Metro North fares to get 20 million extra in revenue, I'm making that up. Right. So what they do, they go ahead and they put that 20 million in the fund, but then at the same time they reduce the state subsidy from the general fund to the DOT by 20 million. Dollars, yeah. So you don't increase the funds in the special transportation fund even if more people take Metro North. Now that's wrong. So I am, I am going to introduce a bill with very specific language. Now, is that uh, going to have to go to do a, con- uh, a constitutional amendment? Does that have that has to go out to the voters? Yes. So. Well, that's a. I'm, I'm going to do it as a bill because yes. I can't introduce no, no, no. it. But um, yes, that was that was what we were debating at the special session, and it's because statute is one thing, but the legislature can change that at any time. A constitutional mm-hmm. amendment, amendment you can't change. must pass by a much larger uh, number of legislators in both chambers, and then go to the people. And I don't want the people to vote on something that they think is going to work but is really just a trick. I, when they vote for using transportation funds only for transportation, I want what they vote for really to do that. What's, what's, what, what's the other, other big one that, uh, that's up there that I, I know nobody really wants to deal with? And that's... Uh, um, the, the constitutional cap on spending. Yes, and that to make that very simple, when they passed the income tax back in 91, yep. they had folks vote on a constitutional amendment mm-hmm. to cap spending every year as a to balance that out. Um, but in order for the, the people voted for it by more than 80 percent. 80 percent, when do you ever get that? And um, then the legislature was supposed to implement the cap by voting on criteria, you know, the parameters for the cap. What do you base it on? Mm -hmm. And they never did it. And it's not because they forgot. It's because they refused. The majority party has always refused. But the reason for that cap is to arrive at a good, solid, based on a number of economic factors, estimate of what taxpayers can reasonably afford in a given year, and then not spending any more than that to require them to pay for what they really can't afford. Well, I would, protection. Think, I would think that this would help you when, when you're going into contract negotiations because it says, look, we can't magically find like That's more right. money a, a, out of this. It, it, of course it would help it's you. It's like if I walked into my boss, you know, he knows already. He's like, well, you know, um, we've already figured this out that we can't go beyond this number for, for, for everybody in the company because this is our profits. 
you know, this is, this, is, this is our expenses, and this is what we can do within that. And, and you know that number. And but, you, but the majority party, which has, they took $6 billion out, of the, out from under the cap for Medicaid a couple of years ago, and then they took another $60 million this time. They don't do that. They don't do what you just said. What they've done is they've told the state employees that they can, uh, they can expect an infinite fount of dollars that will come from taxpayers because there is no cap. Taxpayers have no protection in this matter. And still their services are getting worse. This is not right. Yeah, there's a lot of fixes within the <laughs> system. There, there, there is. And, and unfortunately, I don't think everybody gets a, a straight answer on things when, when, when they ask the questions. That's right. And, and um, it is difficult. Uh, to, to, to face the state and be able to say, well, this is the situation because uh, I've been up in the Capitol. Yes, uh, you have. <laughs> and, 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 and Almost I, every I, day. <laughs> and I, and I, see, I see the lobbyists up there. And um, I see, you know, there's, there's lobbyists on, on every level of every different interest. And it comes down to a point in time where you realize that you can't, you can't please everybody. You, you, you have to do with what you have in, in, in the most efficient way and with, with what makes sense. But it, it's still difficult not to say that I'm going to please everybody. And, you know, I, I, I know uh, our, 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 our good governor uh, ruffles feathers um, sometimes uh, because he's, he's very targeted some in, in, in what he's going after. Um, I, give him, I give him credit for that. Um, you know what? The people who give you advice sometimes don't always give you the best choices within that. Um, but at least you are uh, uh, trying to push some of these things forward. So I, I know I, I talked I talk to uh, Len Fasano after he'd done, uh, done, done with us, and he said, you know, the governor was gracious. He, like, w went through line by line through the budget and said, okay, you know, what do you guys think? Look, you know... I think being governor is probably the hardest job in the world and the most thankless because, you know, if, if you're a mayor, that's a really hard job too, mm -hmm. but it's maybe not quite as hard as being governor. And then if you're president, it's a really hard job, but you get the glory. Mm -hmm. If you're the governor, you're just stuck in the middle. It's a horrible, hard job. I give anybody credit for doing it. But, you know, some of the discourse, some of the rhetoric that we hear, um, particularly at election time, but always uh, at the state level is, well, you know, your Republican governors before that, things were just as bad. You know, they did this, they did. Yeah, okay. But there has been one consistent thing. The legislature, the General Assembly, the House and the Senate, with an exception of two years in the early 90s, have been exclusively controlled by one party. So the policies that we forget the governors, <laughs> mm -hmm. The policies that it's the legislature that votes on the budget. The governor does not. The governor might veto it, but the ultimate authority is the legislature. Or, or, or they can do what happened with uh, Governor Rao. Who they let it go through without her signature. Let it go through without, without her signature, which is, I got, I got to be honest with you. I mean, I, I look at, and I know I've been faced with that whole, like, 30-day, mm -hmm. we don't vote on yep. it, and it becomes automatic. Because... The, the public hearings are, for, for some things are sometimes set down to like the last like, you know, day or there's like, it's, it's a Saturday. Or there is no 30. public hearing. Or there, More and, to the point. You know, you have to have the opportunity for people, if they're coming in to you and, and, and saying, and, and it's difficult, like I said, to get something voted down like with the human services and appropriations mm -hmm. together. Um, uh, you can get amendments through. Um, it's, but that 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 timetable, like down to the last second, and and, and when oh, it goes I up on, I mean it's so unfair. But that's, but that's how they're running it. That's how it's been run for the past forty years. Forty years. If if I were to say anything, I would say you know what you have to vote on things of because how you do. how do you change things in, 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 unless there's you know a vote? You're 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 held accountable. Um, you can't I, I, go take a walk, and plenty of them do. No, and 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 I know uh, I know I, I had I had uh, a, a former um, 
Speaker of the House, uh, James Amon, on our show. We talked like what's <laughs> behind the the cock is door, and um, it, you know he gave some wonderful insight into that. And um, I mean, I get it that some people go into politics and this is their life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on the I mean on the other end. You know, I think there has to be some long-term accountability, and and if there was one thing to change within all all, all the system, if there was, is is term limits, to be able to say that you know uh, you're not going, and I say this across the board, um, that you're not going to be in there uh, forever, and that um, you know uh, it, it gives you the opportunity to really vote on some of these issues rather than your electability mm -hmm. the next time around. Um, so if there was one constitutional amendment that I, I would I would put out there, I mean, that that would probably be it, whatever people came up with. But, I mean, when you look at the whole system, I mean, that's, I mean, I look I look at the U.S. government and, and people, they're in there for life. Oh, I know. I mean, they do have a different arrangement. They can yeah. actually live on what they're paid. Yes, we, no, we, the, uh, the I know, you can't do that. The base salary for <laughs> public, yes. the base salary for a Connecticut legislator, House or Senate, is $28,000 a year. Yep. Okay, so it's you can't live on it. You either no. have to have another job while you're doing it, or you have to have finished your career and just be doing this, you know. Um, it's it's quite... It's, it's, I don't, it's a bit I, of a different story. I don't think the story, public really understands that. I'm, that that's why I'm yeah, saying it very, they're, they're very, like, very clearly. They're well, you know, we should hold their pay and everything else. But, I, like, no, but I do think reality. that um, there's a couple things. One, if you do it without any life experience at all, um, it's really good to have some life experience. Yeah. And number two, um, if you stay in really way, way too long, um, perhaps things start to get a bit stale. And you know, I didn't, I didn't get more specific on either one of those things because I guess it varies by person. But you ought to know when your time has come. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's but, true. But um, I, I, the, the, the point really is that there have been procedures and there has been a, uh, a pol there have been policies that have now been in place for forty years, and they have gotten us to a point where people are leaving the state where people are paying more and more tax and getting worse services. The needy, the truly needy, are not being served anymore. Um, and our transportation infrastructure is falling apart, and they're still trying to build new things when we haven't fixed what we have. Um, there's, these policies are, are not sending us in the right direction, and it's not something that um, it, it's something you have to attribute to the legislature. And uh, we've had the same majority for those 40 years. So uh, that tells us something. Whether you, whether you like it or not, whether it's a, you know, it's not an ideology thing. It's a, like, come on, folks. Something's got to change here. It, it is. And, and uh, I, I think at the time, like, like, like you said, we're dealing with long-term structural issues. I mean, some of these problems go back late 80s when we had a lot of money mm -hmm. and we did right and I, that's right I, like I said I've, I've been I grew up in in Fairfield County you know 40 40 plus years ago yeah I'm, I'm your hometown <laughs> representative yes. you grew up in my district and, and and I know back in the 80s you, you had a lot of defense co contractors you had a lot of uh, uh, machinist jobs and other things along those lines um, it was not as polarized mm -hmm. as what it seems uh, right now. Although the funny thing is, again, and this is really important, you, you see what's going on at a national level. Everybody's mm -hmm. sniping at each yep. other and the ideologies are all over the map and it's very political. In Connecticut, um, I think it's very safe to say that with a couple of exceptions, that the, the vast majority of our Republican caucuses are moderate. Yes. Uh, the um, votes in the House and we do vote on almost everything. The Senate does a lot of stuff on consent, but we debate and vote mm -hmm. on almost everything we bring up. Um, the votes are between 70 and 75 percent unanimous or nearly unanimous. Um, the places where we differ are on budget matters. Mm -hmm. 
and on um, matters that concern union contracts and things like that. Uh, the House Republican Caucus, except for the budget, because we all agree on it together, we talk about everybody's mm -hmm. specific individual concerns, except for the budget, we do not take caucus positions. You vote however you want. Um, and that surprises people. They think that we go into the social issues with some kind of strange, you know, extreme right wing. But we don't. No, I, 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 mean, I, I do know a lot, a lot of, a lot of uh, the Republican caucus, and and they are. Yeah. It's, I mean, look, I mean, you have you have you have to have values that you that you that you hold within yourself because if that's you exactly can't, right. If you can't work off of values, but it, it it doesn't mean that they're not nuanced to to, to no. situations where you can't see. I know you wanted to get to education. I know we only oh, have do. ten minutes left. Oh, we've got to get to this. And we end up discussing <laughs> for sure. like another hour here. Uh, but but you wanted to talk about higher education. I, I do. I am ranking member on the education committee, mm -hmm. um, and there are some K to twelve matters that will come up this time because there's a reauthorization of the federal bill, No Child Left Behind, yep. um, which allows much more freedom to the states than mm -hmm. ever before. Uh, since before all that legislation. So that is going to, we're, we're going to have some discussions about things like testing and teacher evaluations and things like that. We are still studying it. I want to develop uh, a kind of policy point of departure mm -hmm. um, as ranking members so that we know where we're coming from. But, um, you know, we're not there yet. But I think it'll be an interesting discussion and probably fruitful. Um, but there's, an, and there is one very important thing that I'm going to push for again, which is student data privacy laws. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of support from that. We had a great bill last time. It got stuck in the glitch, in the, in the, uh, in the rut at the end of the, mm -hmm. the, the session. But I'm, I'm hoping we will get that through this time. But I am very concerned about something in the area of higher education. And it involves the Connecticut State Universities and the Board of Regents. Um, I am someone who believes very strongly that everyone must have access. They don't need to take advantage of it, mm -hmm. but they must have the opportunity and the access to have a well-rounded college or university education. There's a lot of talk out there now, everybody doesn't need college, some people need to go to a trade school of one kind or another. Well, that's fine, they can choose to do that. Mm -hmm. But even if you're going to do go into a trade or something very highly technical, I believe that the value of a well-rounded traditional education that teaches you to write and think is priceless. It liberal liberal arts. Right? Abs absolutely, and I, I'm I'm a strong believer in that. This Connecticut State University system has existed for a long time to give people who either don't have the means or perhaps didn't get quite the grades mm -hmm. to go to um, either UConn or a private university or an out-of-state university, but still want to get that kind of education and to do it close to home. Mm -hmm. So they serve a real purpose. The Board of Regents, which was formed in 2011. Are they like the, the executive like directors or like the executive like board like on a corporation? They've been given an enormous amount of power. Mm -hmm. uh, it's supposed to bring together the community colleges and the CSUs, the Connecticut State Universities, yep. uh, under one sort of administrative roof and to make all decisions there about a lot of different policies. Um, the Board of Regents has been an unmitigated disaster. They've had four presidents, one of whom had to resign in disgrace, his successor who had to go in disgrace because they either granted unauthorized raises or took too many privileges for themselves they weren't supposed to take. Um, they've promoted um, a, a uh, professor at one of the CSUs who was in jail at the time. He's been repeatedly in jail for things like DUI, threatening a police officer, things like that. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, and they didn't know they were doing it. Um, they have now, so there's a whole series of, if you want to call them blunders, mm -hmm. but the thing isn't working. Recently, um, when the last president went, he had been voted no confidence by the, um, uh, by the faculty of all four yep. CSUs. Uh, there was a contract out to Boston Consulting Group to provide a whole new um, uh, plan for the CSUs, and it cost a great deal of money, and the faculty voted it as untenable. I mean, just a disaster. 
So the governor decided to put his chief of staff, Marco Jakin, Marco Jakin who, I, who I like, I think mm -hmm. Mark is a great guy, uh, to put him in the spot, to call him the temporary president, yet he has a contract of two years that he's committed to fill out. Mm -hmm. So if you're an interim, I thought you were there until they found someone else, but that's apparently not the case. He also has an option to renew. Mark is, I, I have no problem with Mark, but in this position, they doubled Mark's salary and put him there with no background in education at all. Education, higher education, K-12 education, any kind of education, no background in education. Okay, there he is. A contract proposal has gone out to the faculty union of the CSUs. That is, there are, there are many provisions I could cite, but essentially were this contract to be adopted, mm -hmm. it would make a number of the faculty, employees, unemployable anywhere else in the country. It would discourage anyone from any other state from coming to work here in our system. It would diminish the programs available to uh, students and their choice. It would also, um, uh, it would, it would also um, uh, create a situation where um, faculty could be sent from one CSU to another and deprived of their tenure. Uh, there are, the, the contract has nothing to do above all with the primary mission the Board of Regents was created to fulfill, which was to save costs so that then tuition wouldn't have to be raised for so students. So the contract is for, for, this the, contract, faculty, for it the faculty. Has, the contract has nothing to do with saving money. It would lead to more adjunct professors and fewer full-time full employees. It has nothing to do with money. It has to do with turning the CSU system into a vocational system that does not offer a well-rounded education. And I am very angry and disturbed about it, and I think something has to be done. It's not traditional for a Republican to say that the unions are right, <laughs> but on this one, they're spot on. Well, it's, uh, again, there, there are situations where things are, 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 are nuanced. Um, I came from a liberal arts background. I thank God for my liberal arts education. It gives me a, an ability to, to really analyze and take a look at things. Um, I know my degrees in, in psychology, but yeah, I mean, I had courses from Absolutely. history through mathematics through all kinds of different things. It allows you to be able to understand more of the world. And I agree that not everybody wants to, to be able to do that, but I think that those things are important to, to, to offer people and not just a one track, here you, here you go. Because people are going to switch careers of throughout course. their lifetime. But you have to be equipped to learn new things. Right. And that's and that's and that's what I think that, that gives you. I know I, I think I'm down to like three or three or two minutes. <laughs> so I, I didn't know if you had anything that you wanted to, 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 to say to your con constituents out there or what you're looking forward to in the session. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to dealing with the transportation issues, all of them. We discussed a bunch yeah. of them. I'm looking forward to dealing with this Board of Regents situation, which I believe is very serious. I also think that we need to restore funding to the probate courts because uh, now people have even another reason not to die in Connecticut because they've taken the cap off the probate fees. Yes. Um, there are there's some problems with the family courts. Uh, there are, uh, and of course the budget, I don't know if we can iron it out in an off year. Usually you do that in the odd year, but yeah. we're going to have to take some measures. But these, these are all very major issues for me during this session. And I think what I would say to my constituents is I, I feel very privileged to have the, some of the most articulate and informed and committed constituents in the state of Connecticut. They talk to me, they write to me, they let me know what they're thinking, they give me ideas, and I'm very grateful and appreciative of that because it helps me do my job. Dem democracy works when, when people are involved, and, and, and I certainly uh, know that from, from my side. And I appreciate you coming out here, Gail. And thank you for having me, Dominic. I, I, I look forward to, to seeing everybody again. I, I know we'll, we'll be on again with uh, Father Russ. I um, you know we have uh, Please Senator tell Coleman. Father Russ I missed him. I will. We have Senator Coleman uh, com coming up, I believe, in a couple of weeks, um, as well as uh, Robin Porter. 
um, and several other people that we're looking forward to see. So everybody have a good night.